Cambodia, a country of wonder and tragedy, from Angkor to Chong Ek. Hello there. This video is a brief summary of Cambodian history that should give you a good jumping off point for further study of Cambodian history, travel in the country, and a working vocabulary for the rest of the videos in this series. It should be said that this video does contain explicit imagery of the deceased, and if you are sensitive to that kind of material, I would urge caution if you want to watch further. All right, well, millions of people visit Cambodia every year, and many of them will experience their journey via two distinct portals connecting them with this fascinating place. If one begins their journey in the nation's capital, Phnom Penh, it is likely that the first portal they visit will be one of the most confronting physical spaces they've ever experienced. The infamous interrogation center that served as the apex of the Khmer Rouge security network codenamed S21, but now known as the Tool Slang Museum. Walking through the entrance of the former prison presents the first portal into a dark and tragic period of Cambodian, and indeed human, history. More than 14,000 people were sent here during Pol Pot's reign when Cambodia was known by a revolutionary name, Democratic Kampuchea, which lasted from 1975 through to 1979. All but a handful of those sent through its gates, accused of being anti-revolutionary enemies of the regime, were shackled in miserable conditions, regularly tortured to procure their confessions of guilt before being executed nearby at one of the so-called killing fields, known as Chong Ek. Both S21 and its associated mass grave represent just a fraction of the suffering that occurred during one of the 20th centuries worst periods of mass death. Perhaps two million people, or just over a quarter of the entire population, would perish during the three years, eight months, and 21 days that the Communist Party of Kampuchea, better known as the Khmer Rouge, held their country captive in the prison with no walls, a phrase that many survivors came to use to describe their experience in this period of history. Estimates differ, but perhaps half of that total number were the victims of outright execution, the rest succumbing to illness, starvation, or overwork as a result of the revolutionary goals of the organization, or Ankar. If one begins their visit in Phnom Penh, it is likely that their next destination will provide the other portal into Cambodian history, the medieval city of Angkor and the golden age of the Khmer Empire. The monuments of the Deva Raja, or Universal Monarchs, are works of genius. From the largest religious building in the world, Angkor Wat, to the walled city of Angkor Tom, and the beautifully carved faces that comprise the Bayon Temple. The portal to Cambodia's ancient past represents a massive departure from the confronting horror of its modern historical counterpart. Outside of the modern-day city of Siem Reap, one sees the skeletal remains 
of what had been the largest pre-industrial city in the world, the capital of an empire that stretched over most of mainland Southeast Asia, far beyond the borders of Cambodia today. The Khmer that built this city were masters of the water, creating a civilization capable of producing an abundance of resources through careful and ingenious systems of aqueducts and reservoirs, a city that would have maintained a population close to one million people in the Middle Ages. How does one begin to make sense of their journey between these two portals? As a tourist, or indeed for the Khmer themselves? If you are a visitor, depending on your direction of travel, you might have started at one of the most impressive examples of medieval architecture and majesty that exist on this planet, and ended it with one of the most depressing periods of human violence and tragedy that have ever occurred. Making sense of these two contradictory experiences is one way that we can try and explain Cambodian history. It is not the only way, but it is one way that I've found helpful in the years of studying this country's past. This series of videos is intended to be an accompaniment to the in-depth podcast series that I produce called In the Shadows of Utopia, the Khmer Rouge and the Cambodian Nightmare. What could be considered an attempt to try and explore and explain the Khmer Rouge Revolution in the context of Cambodian history, as well as the wider context of world history. These shorter video essays are a way of explaining this history in a different way. One focused on specific questions about Cambodian history historical debates or themes that I believe highlight engaging areas of discussion about a country that has captured a large part of my heart. This series will cover subjects from why did the Khmer Empire collapse to did the Khmer Rouge really kill everyone with glasses? Or maybe even an in-depth explanation or critical analysis of a film like The Killing Fields. But I would like to use this introductory video as a kind of just basic overview that we can use to understand the fundamentals of what will be an ongoing project. So, first things first. Where is Cambodia? Well, the Kingdom of Cambodia is a country that sits in the land between modern-day Vietnam and Thailand, with Laos on its northern border. The dominant ethnic group in Cambodia are the Khmer, and there is evidence that they have lived in this region for more than 2,000 years. The ancient kingdoms of Funan and Chenla preceded what we could loosely define as a unified empire under the rule of the first universal monarch, or the Deva Raja, Jayavarman II. He moved the capital to the area surrounding the Great Lake of Cambodia, the Tonle Sap, and built the foundations of what would eventually become, on and off, one of the most powerful empires in Southeast Asia. Subsequent Devaraja would build a royal city that became the seat of the Angkorian civilization, known as Yasudharapura, or simply as Angkor. As I previously mentioned, the civilization that developed there were masters of the seasons. Cambodia is a monsoon culture, meaning that the year is divided loosely between the wet and dry seasons. The civilization they built utilized a system of reservoirs and interconnected ponds and man-made rivers to produce massive surpluses of the Khmer's most valuable food product, rice. With more rice, the population was able to steadily grow and begin working on the construction projects that have become synonymous with the region today. 
The Empire reached its zenith in the Golden Age of Angkor, between around 900 to 1200 AD. The Khmer dominance of the region would not go on forever, and a combination of factors including the rise of new powerful groups in the East and West, such as the Proto-Siamese and the Proto-Vietnamese kingdoms, changing environmental factors that disrupted the water management system that the civilization depended on, as well as economic and societal changes. These led to the Khmer shifting their capital from the region of Angkor and the Great Lake toward the centre of modern Cambodia and its current capital, Phnom Penh, in a gradual process occurring throughout the 15th century. While this period following the Golden Age of Angkor was usually described as one of decline or collapse, historians tend to deem this period as more transformational than simply one of sudden downfall. There was no cataclysmic event that prompted the immediate desertion of Angkor, nor was there a sharp decline of Khmer influence in the region what could be more accurately deemed the middle period of Cambodian history, ranging roughly from 1500 to 1800 AD, was an era where certain traditions we associate with the Angkorian era, such as building large stone temple monuments or extensive hydraulic works, these fade or transform into the customs we more closely associate with modern Cambodian ones. Theravada Buddhism became the dominant spiritual system, merging with local folk traditions. The Khmer became less influential over their neighbours too, which can be easily discerned from the reduction of their territory in relation to the more powerful Siamese and Vietnamese. In fact, during this middle period, the Khmer kings would at times be completely dominated by one or the other of their eastern or western neighbours. The Vietnamese emperor Gia Long, describing Cambodia as a kind of child that would seek shelter with their mother if their father was angry with them, or vice versa. This lack of independence particularly noticeable during the 1840s, as Cambodia became completely administered by Vietnam, and essentially disappeared as an independent kingdom for a short period of time. And as the 19th century approached, so did the forces of colonialism and globalization. The French Empire would claim Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos by the late 1800s, consolidating this territory into French Indochina. Cambodia was viewed by the French as a timeless, unchanging country, whose people were less inclined to modernise in the same way that their Vietnamese neighbours were. Cambodia, already lagging behind following the series of crises faced in the 19th century, was more or less kept in this slightly neglectful space in the period of French domination known as the French Protectorate. The majority of Khmer people remained largely poor and uneducated, and apart from the major cities, left unaccustomed to the modern world. This situation began gradually changing in the early 1930s, as a small intellectual elite began surfacing in places such as Phnom Penh. This would lead to the growth of Cambodian nationalism, and eventually independence movements. Prince Norodom Sihanouk, a young, enigmatic leader who had been picked by the French, would eventually claim independence for Cambodia in the wake of the French defeat in the First Indochina War, a conflict more or less defined by France being unable to keep its former colony in Vietnam despite relying on its supposed military might. This period of independence for Cambodia was hard to maintain. 
the Cold War had reached Indochina, and the struggle between the communist north of Vietnam and the south, supported by the United States, would eventually spill over into Cambodia. A Cambodian communist movement, dubbed by Sihanouk as the Khmer Rouges, or Red Khmer, would form during this period, primarily trained and organised by the larger Vietnamese one. Eventually, this contingent would become led by a nucleus of Cambodians who had been educated in France, with Salut Tso, better known as Pol Pot, as its head. A US bombing campaign aimed at destroying North Vietnamese and Viet Cong sanctuaries on the Cambodian border would lead to thousands of civilian deaths. Eventually, as he lost his grip on power, Prince Sihanouk was ousted in a coup. The former leader and last of the Deva Raja joined into a coalition with the communists he had previously tried to eliminate. The US-backed government of the new Cambodian leader, Lon Nol, which declared the Khmer Republic, also embarked on a full-on civil war with the communists who were now controlling large areas of Cambodian territory. This bloody war would last for around five years and perhaps lead to the deaths of more than 300,000 Khmer. The Khmer Rouges, boosted by aid from China and recruits in the countryside resulting from Sihanouk's influence, became a force in themselves and began distancing themselves from their Vietnamese counterparts. Highlighting the feelings of animosity that surround relations between the apparent hereditary enemies. Despite their shared communist ideology, the two groups would be far from brothers in arms. Eventually, the US gave up fighting in Vietnam and in Cambodia. As the Khmer Rouge encircled the nation's capital, the situation became increasingly Dyer. On the 17th of April, 1975, the communists broke through, utterly devastating the last remaining vestiges of the Khmer Republic and declaring Cambodia to be under their control. What happened next would shock the world. Phnom Penh and all major towns and cities was emptied at gunpoint. The population of the capital, swollen to upwards of two million people, as refugees from the civil war had fled there, was forced into one of the largest mass migrations of human beings ever attempted. This exodus from the cities is estimated to have caused 20,000 deaths and led some families to walk for weeks before arriving in their designated area in the countryside, to a fate that would be unseen for the rest of the world, as the new country, Democratic Kampuchea, was cut off. All foreigners were expelled, banks were closed, religion and money abolished. Markets Schools, pagodas, and buildings were either shut or turned into prisons, re-education camps, or granaries. A rural, classless society was being imposed 
and the prison with no walls was erected. The Cambodian nightmare had truly begun. In order to rapidly produce a super great leap forward, the Communist Party of Kampuchea began an agrarian revolution, with perhaps a partial goal of recreating the glories of Angkor. The entire population was put to work in communes and collectivized labor in order to build a self-sufficient communist paradise. Centered around a Maoist and Marxist-Leninist transformation program of the countryside. Well, Conditions did vary in different regions within the country. Essentially, the Khmer Rouge had created the first modern slave state, one where life was hard and valued very little. In pursuit of creating a pure revolution, the population of democratic Kampuchea became increasingly subject to suspicions of anti-revolutionary activity. The first group to be targeted was the former members of the Lon Nol regime, and these were to be weeded out and smashed as soon as possible. But even those who merely lived in that former world, the so-called April 17 people, were similarly placed on the bottom of the new social hierarchy, the top of which was the former peasantry, those most amenable to the proletarian consciousness the party wished to cultivate in the entire populace. Those that were deemed to be unwilling, or simply unable, to assume this revolutionary stance, perhaps because of their background, religion, ethnicity, or an inability to work through their sickness and hunger. Well, one commonly recited slogan of the Khmer Rouge elicits how they were treated. To keep you is no gain. To lose you is no loss. Eventually, paranoia about the international relations between democratic Kampuchea and Vietnam would erupt into violence. The regime opting to purge vast amounts of its own membership in the attempt of staving off any potential subterfuge. Many of those accused would end up in S21, where the confessions they were forced to write would fuel more accusations and more arrests. All-out war between the two new communist nations would ensue. The greater picture of Cold War relations would also be influential. Democratic Kampuchea was a valued ally of communist China, while Vietnam was under the Soviet sphere of influence. This larger ideological schism between the two great communist powers becoming even more relevant as a Vietnamese army with a sizable component of former Khmer Rouge defectors would invade democratic Kampuchea. On the 7th of January, 1979, the Communist Party of Kampuchea was ousted. In a depressing example of real politique, the Khmer Rouge were able to regroup their forces on the border with Thailand, fueled by financial and military backing from China, as well as political attempts by the United States to maintain the thorn in the side that the Khmer Rouge represented for the new Vietnamese-backed government known as the People's Republic of Kampuchea, or PRK. Only 20 years later, as the Cold War ended and a degree of opening up in Cambodia had been maintained, did efforts to actively punish the former Khmer Rouge leaders begin. This too a difficult process, considering the current government of Cambodia was comprised of many former Khmer Rouge officials who had previously defected. Like the current Prime Minister, 
Hun Sen. But, after years of negotiating and false starts, the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia was established. Its remit was to prosecute the surviving members of the Khmer Rouge that were deemed most responsible for the events that transpired from 1975 to 1979. However, Pol Pot would not be among those tried. He died in 1998. As of 2020, three members have been found guilty of crimes against humanity, grave breaches of the Geneva Convention, and even for the genocide of two ethnic minorities. Doik, the former commandant of S-21, Nguyen Chair, the deputy chairman of the CPK, and Q Sampan, another member of the party centre. It is unclear just how much longer this method of justice will be pursued. Cambodia, although still recovering from the scars that were produced over 30 years of civil war, death from above and below, it's still a beautiful country, a nation whose sights and sounds still manage to capture the hearts of those lucky enough to visit. Those that do will be confronted by a people dealing with a tragic past, but also with a warm and friendly culture. If you would like to learn about this history in a more in-depth manner, I would suggest subscribing to the podcast In the Shadows of Utopia, as we spend hours teasing apart and explaining the depth of what has only been barely touched upon in this introduction to this history, as well as interviews with historians such as David Chandler. The next videos in this series are all going to be about common questions asked about the Khmer Rouge period, as well as that analysis of the famous 1984 film, The Killing Fields. So do subscribe for more updates about those. If you have a question that you would like to ask, please feel free to write it in the comments below and feel free to visit the website at www.shadowsofutopia.com for more information. Thank you. Until next time, goodbye.